you have enough stem cells for several lives. There was one study in which already exhausted stem cells could be rejuvenated by simply injecting. Alexis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, we actually had, or you joined one of the retreats I had in Iowa, which is where we met. And uh, there we had some nice conversations about all things longevity and you have your own clinic in Barcelona. So yeah, I was figuring, hey, we should have a podcast and talk these things and not just, you know, us uh, talking um, in uh, privately. So we'll do a podcast about it. So I'm, yeah, happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much. Um, happy to be here. Well, it, it was a pleasure to share one week with you and, and all the others and, uh, you know, spend some time with like-minded people, people who uh, apply uh, longevity strategies to their own, to their own life. And um, on my end, uh, I could add my little grain of salt uh, into the conversations mm. since my, my background is medicine. And I, started working in the longevity and regenerative medicine field back in 2019. Um, well, maybe maybe first I should introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Alexis Ortega and I'm a medical doctor in, in Spain. And as I was saying, um, yeah, I started working in longevity back in 2019 after attending uh, the I'm Doing Aging conference series in Berlin hosted by Aubrey de Grey. And I must say that he was a huge inspiration for me. And I really liked the damage repair framework that, that he, that he works with. And uh, that was the, my, my main driver to decide to become part of it, of this, of this world. And then I finished, uh, five master's degrees in five years, uh, one board certification in regenerative medicine by the International Society of uh, Stem Cell Applications. And with this knowledge, I began developing my own strategies, which I, uh, so my, my main idea is that they should be able to be implemented uh, with existing technologies and bring them to the public. So this is the idea behind uh, Adastra Clinic, which I founded in 2023 uh, to integrate cutting edge diagnostic and therapeutic tools to rejuvenate the body, extend healthy lifespan, and treat age-related diseases, including aging of the skin or external signs of aging. Mm. Wow, that's yeah, pretty new, like only one year old. And <laughs> it's only, yes, it's only one and a half years old now. I wow. started in January, but it's really promising. Nice. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people are starting to get more interested in uh, these rejuvenation therapies and the longevity. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess, you know, you mentioned Aubrey de Grey, and he has a pretty grandiose vision of <laughs> this. Uh, He's very ambitious. Let's let's yeah. leave it there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was yeah I wanted to ask like, what do you feel as a practitioner in the field? Like, or what is like, what's available right now? Like, you know, let's dis disregard like the costs. So like, what is actually if you had unlimited budget, what is available for rejuvenation technologies, and like how how much effect would it have on your like longevity right now? Well. First, on the side of measuring, there is a lot of things available. And on the side of uh, therapies, there isn't as much, but the field is growing at a really fast pace. So we still don't have uh, much of the tissue engineering therapy side of it. But we do have some, in my opinion, basic stuff that we can combine, integrate as I said before, and obtain good results. Uh, we're always talking um, on the basis of supposition, right? Because we don't have uh, clinical trials for lifespan in humans, but based on the animal data and based on the in vitro uh, studies, there's a lot of promising stuff. And I can uh, share some of, the, of my clinical feedback. And we've obtained really good results in some age-related diseases, which is the best way to measure the impact of what we do. So uh, back to your question. Um, in my clinics protocol, everything starts with a phase one assessment or measurement. And we have several options depending on budget. But if you had an unlimited budget, as you were saying, uh, I would basically do, first of all, a general checkup. Let's not forget the, the clinics. 
Um, this general checkup would include body composition analysis, of course, and all the all the usual mainstream medicine metrics. Then that would be followed by a series of tests. We would be measuring the NAD levels. We would be measuring at least one epigenetic clock, the immune function, which is a really innovative test uh, based on cell culturing your own cells from the from your immune from your immune system, your telomeres, your toxic heavy metal load, which is really impactful, especially if you have it. Um, the sequence of your entire genome, probably that would be that would be uh, really useful uh, if you had this huge budget we're talking about. This is the most expensive test, but I think it's essential to be able to work on the patient's genetic risks. Otherwise, we're blind in that in that aspect. And then uh, from there, we would obtain a panel of biological ages, and I insist. That's plural, because we have one vascular age, we have one metabolic age, we have one epigenetic age. Epigenetic age is the closest thing we can we can have that correlates to life expectancy, but it's not. I don't like to call it biological age. So it just the age of your epigenome. Mm. Then you would have the age of your chromosomes as well, which would be the telomere length. So from from there, we obtain an idea of how your hallmarks of aging are if they correlate to your age if they're older if they're more advanced or if they are better than than what's expected for your age and health condition mm. and then based on that you get like a good i guess like a dashboard or like a panel of your health status in that Correct. sense like what is your you know biomarkers well we we get an idea of where we should be working uh, the most mm. in your health. Right. Say someone, someone's epigenetic age is 29 and he's or she is uh, 35. Well, we do not have to uh, be too aggressive in rejuvenating the, their epigenome because actually what it shows is that their current lifestyle is already very good. But uh, if their vascular age happens to be 57 or 90, for example, in, in, in one patient I had recently whose age was, whose chronological age was uh, just 59, uh, well, if you have 90-year-old blood vessels, then that's the most important thing if you want to extend your life expectancy. Otherwise, mm. any other intervention will probably be meaningless. Right. So yeah, you you take yeah, the approach that you measure things first and uh, then like a according to the individual's health, you like start improving the results. That's right. That's right. Hmm. And we offer several uh, packages of tests. So in our protocols, depending on the budget, we have a super simplified version, which I like to call the, the mini package in which we only measure those things that are most impactful in your uh, lifespan. And what then, are those things then you can go through as well? Well, th well that would be basically a blood test. Then we obtain the ph phenotypical age from the blood test. It's your blood's age or your organ's age. That's not to be confused with uh, the epigenetic age. Mm. Um, and we would basically be working on optimizing your blood markers and uh, your body composition. That'd be mostly mostly it. Then for more advanced uh, patients or people who want to dig in more, we have like a standard package and then a premium package, which would include all the, the tests mentioned above. And then we can work on genetic risks. We can the array of things we can do is much larger, much right. uh, wider. 
I want to take a quick break to let you know that you can now get my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. However, to cover the costs of shipping for the pre-orders, I decided to also put together a worksheet or a cheat sheet that gives you a two-week workout plan, a one-week bodyweight workout plan, a two-week meal plan, a list of the most effective supplements and their correct doses, as well as the 70 clinically relevant biomarkers discussed in the book and what are their optimal ranges. This entire cheat sheet would normally be worth over $500, but I decided to give it away for only $29. Check out the link in the description or head over to thelongevityleap.com to get the Longevity Leap worksheet. So then goes the phase two. Phase two would be uh, the first step of the therapy once we've measured everything. Phase two would be the cleanup. So the idea is to remove all the bad stuff in your body before we begin regenerating. Uh, that's that's paramount because if we regenerate a sick body, we we can incur in some in potentiating some damage, for example, mutated cells. We don't want to regenerate those, right? right. So phase two would be eliminate toxins, eliminate heavy metals, eliminate senescent cells. How do we do that? So we could use intravenous and oral senolytics. Curcumin is a senomorphic. It's very powerful. It's been used for decades intravenously for cancer patients, for osteoarthritis patients, and it's very well known, its mechanism of action. Quercetin is also a very good one. And it's authorized in several countries for uh, ischemic, uh, ischemic uh, cardiopathies and for uh, chronic heart failure. And it's also a well-known senolytic. So we use that one. Then we use glutathione. We use uh, intravenous chelating agents to remove the heavy metals. Uh, infrared sauna blankets are very useful too to remove microplastics. But um, I'm not sure they they are too impactful on removing heavy metals. I haven't seen great results only with uh, uh, infrared sauna, but it's a nice addition. It can it can help uh, remove the, let's say, uh, the easy toxins. And soon we will be adding ozone as well, which works uh, by a paradoxical, paradoxical mechanism. It oxidizes you, um, but that creates a chain reaction of antioxidant release. Mm, right. So it's basically ozone injected into your blood. We you you get your blood drawn, you get the ozone injected into the blood bag, and then you get your blood back back into your bloodstream. Mm. What's the state of uh, the the art or the state of the evidence uh, with the, some of these uh, therapies that uh, you know a lot of like them... for instance for instance collation collation mm. therapy. Yeah. Um, it's not new. It's been it's been used for very long, although the evidence is mostly observational studies. But there are some good data on its benefits. Uh, so we know it works. We know it's safe if if used properly. If used under some uh, monitoring and replacement, also of the minerals that it removes. It's important mm -hmm. to, to note that when you're removing mercury from your body or lead, you're also removing selenium, you're also removing iron and zinc. Same thing as when, when you drink uh, green tea, for example. If you drink green tea and you've just eaten a high load of mercury, you will chelate that mercury from your bloodstream, but you'll also be chelating other minerals and, mm. and vitamins. So... So I would say the evidence is quite good. What's new is the the combination approach. Mm. Uh, hopefully, at some point, I'll be able to publish some data. Mm, right. You mentioned the, the senolytics to help to eliminate senescent cells, which are like one of the major hallmarks of aging. So, uh, and we talked about in India as well that there's like not a lot of or right now there's no published clinical trials in synalytics yet so what have you seen in your clinical practice with uh, the synalytics i've seen improvements in blood markers i've seen improvements in sa beta gal which is a marker of uh, senescence 
So if the senolytic should work, it should reduce SA beta gal, and that's happened with quercetin, not with curcumin, but the idea behind curcumin would be to uh, block senescent cells, not to destroy them. Uh, mm. So it's a different approach. It's a xenomorphic. The the other thing is improvements in blood glucose, improvements in blood fructosamine, which is a marker of glycation. Mm. And apart from that, only by the use of senolytics, I've seen some mild increase in NAD levels, which, as I said, mm. I, I also measure. So I not only use them because of its proposed effect destroying senescent cells, which, as as you mentioned, is one of the hallmarks, one of the primary hallmarks of aging. That should be good, right? Removing senescent cells when they accumulate, not all the time, but uh, regularly, on a regular basis, uh, should be good because it would allow the other cells to function uh, better. Uh, but also because of its uh, anti-CD38 effects, which is uh, an enzyme that destroys your NAD. Uh, so that's the reason behind the loss of NAD as we age. We have an increased expression of CD38, which is believed to come from senescent cells. And this enzyme destroys a lot of NAD mm. molecules. It consumes it. It's not, it doesn't destroy it. It consumes it to work. Uh, so the enzyme uses NAD as a cofactor. Then we lose the NAD. And no matter w what strategies we apply to replenish it, if we have a lot of CD38, active CD38, or a lot of senescent cells releasing CD38, um, our NAD levels won't be fully restored. So we need, we need to address that issue, either by inhibiting CD38, which would be the xenomorphic approach, the curcumin, or the apigenin, for example, which I use apigenin as well, but only orally. Um, flavonoids, intravenous flavonoids are very interesting because they are they get poorly absorbed uh, through the mouth, through the mm. intestine. So so that's something I give a lot of importance to. Um, either by destroying senescent cells, which uh, we don't know yet if it, if it works in humans, but probably it does. I don't think those mechanisms differ too much from mice, and we know from my studies that it does uh, and also by blocking cd38 mm. so yeah i hope right. that yeah that yeah. answered your question yeah it did uh so you're not only like epigenin you're taking as a supplement and the other ones are I, I give my patients yes i give my patients daily epigenin and once a month for three days, for three to five days, depending on the case, I give them fisetin and quercetin. Mm. Right. With the with, with the IV or uh, orally? Together with the IV, that would be the optimal. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's not an IV that I do uh, regularly. It would be just one course of uh, IV therapy together with the oral medication. And then followed just by the daily oral epigenin. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, then, that's... then the the phase three of the of the protocol would be the regeneration. Mm. And there's when your body is already cleaned. Uh, oh, so sorry, when... so, sorry. Like I'll just. So yeah, like when do you transition from the cleanup phase to the regeneration phase? Like, how long would you, or do you like yeah, base it on the blood markers? If the patient has a high level of mercury, for example, I finish the chelation, which is usually at least five sessions. Mm. That may take around a month. And then afterwards, I repeat the measurements. And if the toxin level is uh, normal or uh, absent, then I start phase three. And in the other cases, it's empirical. So once we finish the the course of IV sessions of uh, senolytics, glutathione, we start with phase three. Mm, gotcha. Then, then in that case, what we do is several things to restore your NAD levels faster. 
than just by using uh, senolytics and senamorphics. That would be IV NAD, subcutaneous as well, to get a slow release. Um, we do peptide therapy and we do exosomes. And the idea behind that is to put dormant stem cells that your body has, mostly in your in your bone marrow and in your fat, uh, back into circulation. So they will be responsible for most of the regeneration process that will that will take place. And hopefully soon we'll be doing hyperbaric oxygen as well to mm. regenerate telomeres and to uh, reinforce the, the senolytic effect because that's uh, the way it regenerates telomeres probably. Um, I'm just guessing it's not proven, but uh, probably the the effect regenerating telomeres is not just mimicking exercise, but also uh, removing senescent cells and promoting differentiation, promoting releasing uh, stem cells into circulation. Mm. Right. So yeah, can you walk us through of or explain a little bit like the exosomes? So it's, sure. I think some people have heard about them and, uh, yeah, like what are they and yeah, how does, how do they work? Mm -hmm. Exosomes. Exosomes, when we speak about exosomes, we speak about a cellular product, but they're not cells. They have tiny nano sized vesicles produced virtually by any cell. So a cancer cell produces exosomes that should mm. be made clear. Not all exosomes are good. Okay. Right. Exosomes work as signaling molecules, and they connect information between cells. So they are a cell-to-cell -cell communicator or messenger. So when in regenerative medicine we talk about exosomes, we refer to mesenchymal stem cell exosomes mostly, which is a type of uh, adult stem cell that we have. As adults, we have them in the bone marrow, we have them in the fat tissue, we have them. Uh, Virtually every tissue has some type of uh, stem cell stored in there. But the ones on the lung, on the skin, are called parenchymal stem cells, part of the parenchyma of the tissue. And the ones that would get released into the circulation when they need it are called mesenchymal stem cells. And they are mostly dormant. So they don't work until they need it. Then these stem cells have their effects mediated by exosomes that they release. So almost 100% of what they do is done via exosomes. And stem cells from, from the mesenchymal stem cells uh, can divide into bone, they can divide into heart, nerve, neuron, under certain conditions, muscle, cartilage, skin, liver, so lots of things. Then, the problem with stem cells is the availability. So we need to remove some, some of your fat tissue or we need to puncture your bone to remove some of the bone marrow to get the stem cells. Whereas exosomes can be obtained, for example, from umbilical cord. They're mm. much more easy to work with. We get the exosomes from healthy donors. It's really important that you get them from a certified lab that works with good manufacturing practices, obviously, that's done their due diligence uh, screening for any pathologies, uh, making sure that they uh, are characterized so that we know which micro RNAs they contain. That's the, that's the other aspect I wanted to mention. So exosomes contain inside a lot of information that that information is stored in form of short chains of uh, genetic material. It's RNAs of two, two types, messenger, and micro RNAs. Then it also has um, an exosome. It also has growth factors, which stimulate your own dormant senescent cells. So if I inject uh, exosomes from an umbilical cord or from a from from a from a donor's fat, I will be activating your own uh, stem cells. It's mm. not just the active effect of the exosome but the stimulating effect that they have locally and in the in the distance. For example, I use exosomes for osteoarthritis, I inject them in the joints, then they will regenerate cartilage. They work beautifully for pain, for chronic pain. I inject them in the bloodstream, 
then they will work. Uh, they can cross the the blood brain barrier very very easily since they're so tiny. They can cross it, so they will work. For example, for Parkinson's disease, improving memory. They will work um, for any inflammatory autoimmune disease uh, because they have an immunomodulatory effect. Mm. Basically, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and they impair the mechanisms by which you develop autoimmune diseases. Right. So they can improve lupus, they can improve diabetes. It's not that they can cure it, obviously, mm. but they can improve the markers and uh, make the management better of those diseases. And in terms of aging, if you were really ambitious uh, to improve your biological age, um, I'm sure they can provide a really deep effect by reaching virtually every tissue injected through bloodstream or intramuscularly. Um, and they can reduce the, the risk of cancer, not just autoimmune diseases, since they seem to have an anti-tumor effect through certain microRNAs. And, and that's really interesting. That's fascinating because stem cells get released when they detect a cancer. Mm. Mesenchymal stem cells, you would think they may help the cancer grow faster, right? They may help the cancer cells divide, but they don't do that. In some studies, in some published studies in cancer patients, stem cells seem to have a cytotoxic effect on tumor cells via mm. exosomes. Mm. So they sabotage the, the cancer cells. They don't succeed all of the um, all of the times, but they help. Uh, they help prevent the tumor to grow faster. And in in the exosomes case, uh, they're being studied at the moment as potential drug carriers for chemotherapy agents because they're so good at detecting the cancer cells that they can bring the chemotherapy agent directly into the cancer cell, preventing all the undesired side effects on the other cells. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting. So it kind of, um, yeah, like I guess regeneration is a you like a pro semi proper term here that it helps to regenerate it does the body. Other things. Some things, yeah, it does. Mm. It does other things, probably epigenetically as well, but uh, that's not that's not to take for granted yet. But probably it rejuvenates the epigenome, mm. and it's anti fibrotic as well. It works well for post-severe COVID cases, which I treated. And it does work very well for aesthetic purposes, uh, which is still uh, a big chunk of the market, uh, mm. let's say. So I treat a lot of hair loss cases, uh, wrinkles, skin aging, sun damage. It does work repairing sun damage. And uh, as I as I was saying, I use them as part of a complex strategy to treat chronic diseases, mm. Parkinson's disease, for example. I use okay. them combined with IV NAD, which has also been published in some uh, case series that it reduces tremor, it increases attention, and it increases memory. Mm. With the, with the exosomes, like I guess the exosomes would fall more closer to what Aubrey de Grey is talking about in terms of like a future regeneration uh, technology. So, but, 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 but it's not still that. <laughs> it's it's not, not that sophisticated. Yeah, probably probably a... Aubrey, Aubrey yeah. would engineer those exosomes to contain just one type of microRNA to get an exponentially larger effect on, say, mm. removing fibrotic tissue, removing, removing, uh, glycosylation products for example mm. so so they're they're very promising tool just still in the early stages but yeah again that doesn't mean we cannot use it we can yeah. use it i think the, the the future of exosomes will uh will be uh the proteomic analysis so that we can characterize well what they contain and use them like laser focused for one target so the exosomes would mostly like um, improve, I guess, the functional so, so, outcomes and age-related conditions. So the thing is, the the effect of the exosome will depend on the original cell that secreted it, 
mm. and the specific circumstances in which this cell secreted it. Okay. So, the mesenchymal stem cell may be subject to different stimuli. For example, an injury. It will secrete exosomes to help the skin injury or the bone injury repair and regenerate. Whereas if this mesenchymal stem cell is uh, stimulated by uh, an autoantibody, for example, an autoantibody that's, that's present in lupus, it will produce a different type of exosome. And that's what we don't know yet. Mm. We don't know exactly what everything that's inside the exosome does. We have studied the effects and we know they're for the most part good, but we cannot, at least to my knowledge, develop uh, exosomes for one single purpose that uh, that work uh, really well in just that purpose. Mm. Right. What would be what? What is like? What 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 a bridge needs to be closed <laughs> for? Uh... I guess uh, actual like life extension like so it's obviously not that sophisticated yet so what what do you think is like missing uh, or what what uh, needs to happen in the body or like that to happen with uh, something something like exosome maybe something else let me see so let me see if I got your question right uh, you saying what do we need to do mm. to make exosomes really impactful in extending longevity in extending lifespan yeah yeah well first of all we need to characterize them well and we need to understand what every short chain of genetic material and growth factor that they contain is for then once we understand that if not 100 percent 90 percent then we can engineer exosomes for one specific target, molecular target. Mm. Let's say, get rid of uh, advanced glycation end products, which they accumulate with age, and that's one of the hallmarks, one of the new hallmarks of aging. Uh, I think I seem to recall they are 12 now. So glycation, it's a really problematic one because we haven't come up with a strategy to uh, get rid of glycation once it it accumulates to a certain extent and it increases the chance of uh, developing disease so that would be an option that would be a a, a way of using them mm. then uh, in the end we can also they offer a huge potential because we can also also use exosomes to carry a drug that's for instance rapamycin or any rapalog that's promoting autophagy in every tissue, for example, the brain, we can bring that drug to the brain and remove all the damage and restore the proper function of each part of the brain and therefore prevent brain degeneration, neurodegeneration. Mm. But we're not seeing that yet. Right. It's, it's under development. Uh, Hopefully, within the next 10 to 15 years, we'll start to see some of these into clinical trials. Gotcha. What about peptides then? Those are also like peptides popular right now. Yeah. They're very popular, yes. Uh, although they're not new at all. Mm, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the, with the published literature on peptides, but it mostly comes from 1980s in, in the Soviet Union. Mm. So it's uh, not a matter of interest for the pharmaceutical companies, although they're very safe and they've proven effective for several indications. I really like peptides and I use them. As I told you, I, I apply them on the, on the phase three of my rejuvenation protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, epithalon. Epithalon is epithalamine, the synthetic version of, of the hormone, of the lesser known hormone produced by the pineal gland, same gland that produces melatonin, but everybody speaks about melatonin and nobody speaks about epithalamine. Mm -hmm. So epithalon regenerates thalamus. Mm. 
it's an impressive tool. It's a natural natural molecule, doesn't generate any allergy, and it's used uh, subcutaneously. Once a year, it's a course of five injections, and it does provide several benefits that have been published. It improves metrics of uh, physical performance. Um, there was one study in which in it was it was a population study in 266 uh, participants, I think, um, which were followed up for six years. And after epitalon injections, they increased uh, overall survival by 1.6 to 1.8 fold, mm, which is wow. amazing. Uh, yeah, that was published a long time ago. And as I was telling you, there's not an incentive from, from the pharma industry to keep studying them because they're not something that can be patented. They're natural mm. molecules. Only the synthetic ones, such as uh, the, the GLP-1 agonists, uh, which are very popular now right. for <laughs> obesity and overweight patients like Ozempic, mm -hmm. uh, are being developed. The, the ones that are under a patent but the natural ones are not um and to me that's that's a mistake right uh so as i was telling you epitalon uh, some of the some of the benefits it improves circadian rhythm it regulates the release of mel uh, melatonin it it improves uh, fat and glucose metabolism and physical endurance it protects genes and chromosomes and the treated groups showed less fewer mutations and fewer chromosomal aberrations, which is something to take into consideration if we want to live a long time, because uh, random mutations happen all the time. We need to protect our genes. Mm. And other other um, interesting peptides are, for instance, uh, thymosine alpha-1 or thymoline, which are uh, thymus peptides. They regenerate immunity, your immune system, they help you fight infections, cancer. They've been recently studied for COVID as well. And another group, uh, completely different from, from these two, cerebralizing, cortexin, the so-called nootropic peptides. So peptides that stimulate memory, cognitive function, and that could help in... Uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, injury, so like uh, stroke, post-stroke patients. Right, sure. What about BPC-157? That's like probably the most... BPC-157 is, is one I don't particularly use, but uh, I've heard a lot about it. Um, they say it works restoring the intestinal epithelium which can be really interesting uh, for leaky gut patients and patients which have malabsorption syndromes. Uh, it's something I, I'd like to try, yes. Mm. But I don't have experience with, with BPC-157. Gotcha. And you mentioned that uh, the epithelin is like five doses per year. So like, That's right. like how does it look like you do five it? Five shots. Like five shots in, in one week or how frequently? It's on alternate days. Okay. So it's uh, on on a personal ground. It's something I am going to try, but I want to first measure my telomeres mm. and see, first of all, see if I can r obtain like more than one benefit from them. Mm. So I want to measure my telomeres first and then afterwards use epithalon if they're not at least if they don't correspond to what my age should be um, and see what happens. And apart from that, I want to use them for the uh, genoprotective effects that I mentioned before. So the their effects protecting genes from mutations. Mm. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. In also, also, it's a very interesting approach for uh, restoring melatonin. Mm. Instead of supplementing melatonin, we could be using epitalon and see. Yeah. And then the other test, which I don't regularly do, but it's available, is is the melatonin curve in saliva. You measure the melatonin concentration 
several times during the day and check if your calf has the physiological mm. shape or not, which should be right. start to go up after sunset, stay high for two to six hours and then go down and then stay very low during the day. And if that's dysregulated, we could use epitalon to, to stimulate it, to regulate it instead of just uh, exogenous melatonin. Yeah, that's for sure like a good idea because yeah, melatonin goes down with age and they think yeah, part of the reason has to do with the deterioration of the... And we don't know why. Yeah. That's the other thing. Some people speculate that it's due to lack of regulation by epithalamin. Mm. So the, the pineal gland becomes calcified. Some authors say that that's because of the inherent uh, process of melatonin synthesis that as a byproduct creates calcium and destroys the gland. Others say that it's due to inflammation. So we don't know. No. But what we know is that the, the gland becomes calcified. Also, there's toxics such as fluoride, which if they mm. are present in high levels for a long period of time, will accelerate calcification. But even without fluoride, we will all have calcified right. pineal gland sooner or later. So that's, mm. let's be clear. That's not the cause. That's a contributing factor. Then one one of the one interesting area of of research is uh, pineal gland uh, regeneration mm. i think that they are using some ultrasounds now in animal studies to attempt at regenerating the the pineal gland once it's calcified and mm. it seems to be working oh that's interesting what would they use to regenerate it just ultrasounds Oh, ultrasounds, okay. <laughs> sort of, I don't know if, the, if it's shock waves. I don't know if it's if it's painful or not. But uh, mm. it's at least a non-invasive technique in which uh, you wear sort of a probe, helmet probe, mm. which uh, bombards your pineal gland with the ultrasounds. Okay. And probably what it does is just activate the dormant stem cells. Mm. So it all comes back to our regenerate regenerative. Uh, uh, capacity. Right. So, is there is there a, like uh, so? I've heard that you know that you only have a certain amount of stem cells, and if you like activate them too much, then you deplete them, and then you won't have them later. Well, yes, but no, because you have stem cells. You'd have them. You have enough stem cells for several lives. Okay. So, one single stem cell can divide for a really long time if the conditions are good. And that's the key aspect. If you are sick, if you smoke, if you don't sleep well, if you don't exercise, the stem cell will exhaust faster. Mm. There was one study in which um, already exhausted stem cells could be rejuvenated by simply injecting high mega doses of vitamin C into your bloodstream. It was uh, an animal study, mm. but uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, area of research. So my take is that even once you're 65, more than 95% of your bone marrow doesn't work. More than 95% has become yellow bone marrow that doesn't have active stem cells. And yet, with only just 5%, your body can keep you active and working, and every eight years it can regenerate your heart, it can regenerate every tissue. So we have multiple backup copies, mm. a lot of backup copies. If we take care of our organism, of protecting our stem cells, their lifespan is going to be extremely long. So oh. they generate telomeres, they regenerate their telomeres, and the only dangerous thing that we don't know is what will happen if we keep aging for, say, 150 years or older, 
and these stem cells begin accumulating mutations, probably we would develop some of the most aggressive forms of cancer. And that's something that one right. day, hopefully, we'll have to address. Not now. But mm. um, the thing is, with a healthy organism, stem cells can work very well for a very long time and they remain healthy and their differentiation capacity mm. will remain active. Yeah, like let, let's first try to get to 150 and yeah. then, then, then let's start worrying should, about what you do. That with should the be our main concern now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not what will happen later. Yeah. But uh, so I guess the question is like, you know, we have all these stem cells. So why do we, why don't we live to 150? So what do you, what do you think? There's many things that hinder their ability that mm. uh, sabotage our bodies before that. Main thing I would say, atherosclerosis, but also any degenerative disease, neurological or else. Um, for instance, uh, supercentenarians have a form of amyloidosis that is what kills most of them. We don't see that in younger people because we don't have enough time to develop them. But supercentenarians have, what they have in common is a specific um, uh, array of uh, genetic polymorphisms that protect them from heart disease, cancer, hypertension, diabetes, Alzheimer's. So they don't develop those mostly, or they delay the development for a very long time. Yeah. Then they have a few more decades to develop other age-related diseases. And one of them is the the cardiac amyloidosis, which ends up in heart failure and is what ultimately kills most of them. Mm. So, but I forgot your question. Uh, sorry. It was uh, why if why we, the, have what, yeah, if we have all those stem cells, cells. Yes. Well, I can, I can give you a personal example. Uh, my grandfather lived to be 99. Wow. Okay. He That's didn't good. apply any, any anti-aging <laughs> strategy. Yeah. So it was purely out of uh, his lifestyle and his genes, which I hope to have at least <laughs> inherited in a 25% 25% yeah. load. I don't know. But, uh, well, he lived in a time in which he wasn't surrounded by as many pollutants, as many toxics, and probably he his sleep was better than mine mm -hmm. um, in his stress levels as well. Anyway, so the thing that he died because of um, atherosclerosis, which uh, ended up in a complication causing massive uh, brain hemorrhage. Hem mm. uh, uh, so uh, the, the brain hemorrhage killed him because he had been developing atherosclerosis for a very long time. Um, Without so without that factor, if we had been able to completely erase atherosclerosis from his body, he would have lived who knows how longer, but a lot longer since all the other markers were extraordinarily good, were like almost from a teenager. Mm. His his cholesterol level was a teenager's. Mm. His blood pressure was good. His Glucose was good, so, and his physical, um, his physical condition was extraordinary. He was driving a car until he was ninety six, mm. so, and he was carrying wood and he was performing most of the of the home tasks on his own. Probably his body, his stem cells, were working very well, regenerating every tissue, every now and then. So, so the potential is, I, will, I won't say limitless, but it's much more than what people, even scientists, think. Mm. So, yeah, so, so like the reason we don't live that long is we have the stem cells, but people die to the chronic diseases before that, you know, and the same can happen with like different types of uh, diseases, like, you know, atherosclerosis or Alzheimer's or cancer. Those are like many of these uh, chronic diseases. That's, that's exactly my point. Mm. So instead of addressing each chronic disease as a separate entity, 
we should address the hallmarks of aging. Mm. And that's the shift of paradigm. Right. What if, uh, you know, someone has whatever it is, diabetes or kidney disease or atherosclerosis, so the biggest, I guess, effects on lifespan will come from treating those diseases. If I catch them once they've already developed it, yeah. well, then their lifespan is already limited. Right. By usually around the decade, they lose a decade by already having diabetes, for instance. Then we must work first and foremost in optimizing the management of their disease almost to the point of uh, reaching the markers of a healthy individual as aggressively as possible without taking any risks. Yeah. Once we've achieved that, we can start working on everything else, on what right. I would be working on if you came to my clinic, for example. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, the, it's like in smoking, there's the concept of pack years. So if the, the more, the lo more years you smoke, the more of like exactly. the damage you exactly. accumulate and the same with like, and, and the longer you've been a diabetic for, yeah. the more it will condition you and your lifespan. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what age you get it. Like you want to try to, um, treat, the uh, the markers of uh, diabetes or whatever the chronic disease is as, as, as I like, guess, fast and aggressive as, as like reasonable. Pro probably I'd be doing everything at the same time, but mm. paying more attention to the markers of, of their disease. And if I can at the same time improve, uh, their vision, their cognitive, uh, performance and their epigenetic age, of course I will do it. It will probably have, uh, like uh, retroactive effects yeah. on their disease. Mm. So maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, heart disease and atherosclerosis. You said, yeah, it's probably the, it's like, not the number my, one. my area of expertise, uh, but yeah, yeah but, but I, I, I was going to ask, like, is, is, is there any ways like regenerative therapies for atherosclerosis or is there a way to also like remove the plaque or something like that? If we enter in the in the terrain of suppositions, I will say that I'm a huge believer in the fact that, that senolytics probably do clean the arteries of uh, plaque as well. Mm. Okay. It's something I'd like to see on a clinical trial, of course. It, it's something okay. I might consider uh, uh, study at one point by myself. Uh, because it's it it would it would mean a huge change. So at the at the moment, there's very little evidence that anything can remove calcified plaque. We can remove soft plaque from the arteries. Once mm. it's calcified, statins seem to have an anecdotal benefit, really a tiny one, uh, but nothing else. So so probably by using hyperbaric oxygen, we'd be able to improve endothelial function and, and who knows if reducing plaque, but at least we would um, halt the progression of the right. plaque. If you've yeah. already had some with hyperbarics, with uh, stem cell therapy, uh, I would, ha I should, I should uh, review the literature, which I haven't for some time uh, on stem cell therapy for atherosclerosis because i i'm sure there's something there's something published on on that on that mm. topic for the soft plaque you would or like for the soft plaque re removal reduction i guess like lowering the lipids and, and uh, just uh, by just by doing cardiovascular exercise you will reduce it mm. lowering blood lipids cardiovascular exercise sauna mm. Gotcha. You can do really simple things to reduce soft plaque, and we measure it uh, at the carotid bulb, the carotid artery, by measuring the, the thickness of the intima media layers of the of the arterial wall. And it's does that look at the soft plaque or the uh, calcified plaque? The that looks that looks only at the soft plaque. Okay. If there's calcified plaque, you will see it, but it won't provide an estimation of the entire amount of uh, calcified okay. plaque then you'd need you would need a ct scan for that okay so we will have an estimation 
and a modifying factor on the in the equation of your total 10 year heart risk so if your cholesterol levels and your blood pressure are low but your intima media thickness is really high then your your blood uh, your sorry your heart risk is higher than than expected by the by the commonly used metrics mm. so yeah that, that's the ultimate risk <laughs> the, the the idea is, is yeah it's is to have it as 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 short as possible so as as small mm. as possible mm. yeah yeah i guess in the future maybe there will be some ways to like uh, re remove it with some kind of therapies but uh, yeah <laughs> time will tell mm. yeah, so yeah that will I probably think... have the biggest like effect on the life expectancy because if you you know help to reduce uh people's heart disease then you'll a lot of people will live a lot longer i think there's potential in stem cells but i'm i'm sure it should it, it would have to be engineered stem cells to make them go to the arterial wall and work by removing the the foam cells the calcium calcified plaque and mm. rebuilding the endothelium yeah but it's something that i i still don't see don't see coming to the clinic anytime soon for sure okay so we, we talked a lot the, on the third stage of the process that you mentioned which is regeneration we've talked about peptides and exosomes uh so is there anything else in this stage that needs to be covered well maybe we can talk about supplements because uh yeah. my my protocols include a lot of supplements mm -hmm. on my personal strategy i take 40 plus supplements as as you may remember from from our week in india uh we were sharing insights and ideas and i think uh joe cohen was the <laughs> the one who <laughs> who yeah. got the the first the first uh, position by taking 160 something supplements a day uh i'm not at that level but i take a lot of supplements and i give a lot of supplements to my patients mm -hmm. so well i i could say i could I could give you like my top five or my top ten. Yeah, I think so. Full longevity. Really good. Uh, so for longevity purposes, I'm not talking about general health. Uh, I really like NAD precursors, no matter which one. It could just be niacin, but uh, my favorite is nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, uh, because it transforms directly into NAD. Whereas nicotinamide riboside and R transforms into NMN first. So we skip one, one step, just that. Once they get into the cell, they transform into NAD. They, I, I stack them with uh, flavonoids, again, apigenin. If we want to increase NAD, we don't just have to keep pumping more precursors into the body, but to reduce, we need to block the enzymes that destroy NAD as we age. Uh, also with trimethylglycine. I like trimethylglycine also because it has other properties, like it lowers homocysteine. It seems to improve physical performance as well, so I take it nonetheless. But combined with NMN, just to replenish the pool of methyl groups that will uh, that will empty every time our body eliminates uh, NMN because it transforms it to nicotinamide by consuming mm. methyl. Then we we have huge amounts of nicotinamide that needs to that need to to be removed from the bloodstream, and then um, we need to keep pumping the the methyl groups, which are essential for epigenetic homeostasis and other things like uh, uh, healthy arteries. Uh, so that was number one. Although yeah, although I mentioned. Uh, three supplements, but it would be like a three in one package. Then I like melatonin. I'm not scared of uh, mega dosing melatonin, although that may not be for everyone. Mm. Um, nothing serious, but it can cause some some uh, uh, like daytime sleepiness. It can cause very 
intense dreaming activity, which is uncomfortable for some people. Drowsiness. There's other other side effects. If you metabolize it very fast, it can wake you up in the middle of the night. So in those cases, you need to take the slow release form. I take around five to ten milligrams of melatonin mm, daily. Mm, I've given up to fifty milligrams to some patients for a sh- for shorter periods of time. So that would be number two, melatonin anti-tumor effects, neuroprotectant effects, uh, mm, indirect antioxidant. There's no danger of reductive stress by giving melatonin. Whereas if you give too much vitamin C daily, you you may shift from too much oxidative stress to too much reductive stress. Then number three would be AKG. Alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate in the arginine form, not the calcium one. I'm not taking any calcium. I'm not supplementing any calcium due mm-hmm. to the safety concerns of calcium. So the the main problem with arginine alpha ketoglutarate is that its half life is very short. So I divide it into two takes, usually one gram a day. Although when I work out, I may take up to five grams. And it's proven to be safe. It's a good ergogenic. Uh, arginine promotes the release of nitric oxide, so it will increase the pump of your resistance training workouts. And the alpha ketoglutarate will stabilize your epigenome. And it's been proven to rejuvenate the epigenetic age. So mm. that, to me, is a re- reason, a good enough reason to take it. Uh, so I said melatonin, NMN. AKG number four would be lithium. Mm. It works similar similarly to AKGs. It stabilizes the epigenome, but it also protects telomeres. It does not regenerate them, but it will protect them. It will extend the Hayflick limit of healthy mm. cells, and it will impact favorably other hallmarks of aging. It will improve mitochondrial function. It will reverse the loss of proteostasis. And the epigenetic alterations. So again, more than more than one reason to take it. Although in really small doses, it would be up to five milligrams a day lithium in the form of uh, organic lithium orotate salt, not the one we use in the clinic for uh, yeah. psychiatric patients, which is an inorganic form. Mm, what else yeah. then uh number four number five probably probably glynac mm. which i'm i mean you're an expert on on glynac and i'm sure you mm. can give much more much more insight than i can do but it's a precursor to glutathione it's not something i would consider to take since uh, at the moment since i'm 35 I am taking it because of my last blood test, my gamma GT, my liver enzyme, this particular one was a little high, so Mm. I want to bring it down. But once I brought it down, I'll stop it. But I intend to take it and I give it to patients 45 years or or older. And and to younger patients, I give glycine, just glycine. I don't know what what your opinion on, on that would be. Whether you agree or not, yeah. I mean, I think the at least the clinical trials on glynac they're usually done in people like seventy five or older. So yeah, it's hard to say that it's going to have like massive benefits in people like younger than that. But I think like glutathione typically starts to decline after the age of forty five. So that's where I'll start to take the glycine and NAC. Or you know, I'm taking glycine every day right now, but I'll add NAC daily. You know, after that age, probably. But uh, yeah, like I think when you're younger than with that, with the then purpose it... of maintaining youthful glutathione levels. Yeah, yeah, for the antioxidant benefits. So um, yeah, and of course, depends on some other factors as well. But I do take NAC if I've 
gotten sick or something like that, you know, which doesn't mm-hmm. happen often. But mm-hmm. but I still use NAC on some cases occasions, and there's like evidence that NAC reduces muscle soreness as well, so that can be also useful for the king. Maybe after some, if you have a digestive intoxication, if you mm-hmm. eat some yeah bad food, food poisoning food. or yeah whatever exactly exactly yeah and COVID and stuff like that, I'll I'll usually this, take like them as a as a recovery. Mm. Yes, as to, yeah. as recovery aid. Yeah. Yes, that that that's I I would agree on that. Um, glycine. Uh, you said you you wouldn't be sure whether uh, it would provide any huge benefit in, to young people or no. no I, I meant the, I meant the You're, NAC probably yeah, like because uh, I'm taking glycine already right now, so like you know, ten grams a day. How, how about taking glycine? So, mega dosing glycine. I think to yeah. counteract the effects of a high methionine diet because that's my approach personally yeah i eat i eat a lot of meat so yeah, i take I, around five grams daily yeah i i take also for that reason or one of the reasons i take uh, glycine is for the methionine so it reduces the effects of methionine on homocysteine and longevity so i take it also for the collagen benefits and uh, yeah, even sleep. Oh yeah, sleep. Sleep instead, benefits. Instead of collagen, you take glycine. I take collagen as well. So, but uh, you get only like three grams of glycine from collagen, whereas mm-hmm. you might need up to like thirteen, 12, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah. twelve, fifteen. So, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I think that's you know kind of the my take on the glycine <laughs> requirement. Like uh, a lot of people take very little; they might take two grams or something like that. But I think. You know, so to to so promote it's collagen. not essential, but I think it's um, optimal to get larger amounts and, for collagen uh, for collagen turnover. Yeah, and otherwise no, the, the the body will prioritize uh, collagen only re- replenishing the collagen of the organs, and will forget about the skin probably. Yeah, yeah, and uh, one thing I actually recently discovered. So like, I measured my visceral fat at the IVA clinic, and it was like fifty four grams, which is like super low. And I think one, you know, there's many things I do. Is it, is it provided in grams or in levels? I forgot. I thought it was. It has, some... uh, it, well, like it has grams as well as this, this cubic, not cubic, but the square or centimeters or something volume. as well. Yeah. But volume. something that's, that's confusing in DEXA for me is uh, it doesn't provide information on the organ mass. So probably mm. that's included as fat. Or as muscle, depending on the organ, the heart would probably count yeah. as, as muscle. Yeah, because it, but it's lean tissue. But that, that that's something that I don't like about DEXA. Probably the the only thing I don't like. But um, mm. yeah, you were mentioning that that um, I was saying that the gly- fat was very low, and and you attribute yeah glycine you- glycine. I think uh, glycine uh, attributes that because a uh, methionine restriction. Has been seen to reduce visceral fat in animals and humans, and gly- low glycine levels are also linked to higher visceral fat. And I take a lot of glycine, and I also did a video about it, so sort of comparing Brian Johnson and Paul Saladino. So you have Brian Johnson, who is on a vegan diet, who doesn't get almost any glycine from his diet. His methionine intake is also low, but his glycine levels are also, or glycine intake is also quite low. He takes only like twelve hundred milligrams, whereas you have Paul Saladino, who eats a lot more methionine, he might get more glycine as well from his diet, from the collagenous uh, tendons and stuff, but his methionine intake is high, so the ratio between the methionine and glycine for him is still kind of He eats a lot of equal. organs, right? Yeah, yeah. so he's getting more glycine, but he's also getting a lot of methionine. Whereas me, you know, I'm eating less methionine, I don't eat that much muscle meat, but I supplement a lot of glycine, so I have very low methionine and very high glycine ratio. In my diet, so that might, in my eyes at least, but you <laughs> you take a lot of carbs, it. which would increase yeah. visceral fat theoretically. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. Like it, mine was like very low. I think uh, the carbs mostly come from overconsumption of uh, the carbs. So like I'm just when when uh, they if accumulate. I'm weight, if yeah. I'm losing weight, then I'm not storing the carbs as fat. So uh, no. yeah. No, but if you're bulking, for instance, I've been. Yeah, doing a I mean, bulk bulk for the past uh, around 12 months and I began noticing an increase in visceral fat for the past two months now I'm mm. 
cutting it and starting caloric deficit. But uh, yeah. even if it's not an overabundance of carbs, if you follow a high carb diet for a long time, eventually they will accumulate into into fat, into visceral into visceral mm. fat. Yeah. So so it's interesting that I, that I did actually in, decrease it. So like I, I measured it in no- November, so uh, ten months ago, my visceral fat was three hundred and fifty grams. So I've lost three hundred grams of visceral fat. Although I'm eating like the same higher amount of carbs right and now. And did you did you change the intensity of your training? I uh, increased it. I, I I increased maybe like a little bit hit, but uh, my I did kind of similar amount of cardio and uh, weights. So the same routine, only pretty much the only the cutting in calories and the yeah. adding of glycine. Um, I was taking glycine back then as well, but um, I think I was. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say exactly what you know pinpoints well, the, the result. Increasing the dose. Yeah, I was more consistent with it. I was taking like more. I was putting yeah, like tablespoons into my shake. <laughs> uh, whereas well, in, uh, it's it's an it's a, it's an easy thing to to study if you have a bioimpedance uh, scale. You you stop glycine for six months and see what happens. Mm. Then re- restart it without changing your gym routine and without changing the the calories, your daily calories mm-hmm. or their distribution throughout the day. Uh, it's it's interesting, although it would provide data only on on you. But but it's it's something that's really cheap to add for those which have too much visceral fat. Uh, stored just in case. Yeah. So since we were saying glycine has many other benefits, uh, just just for the sake of uh, uh, improving uh, improving your lifestyle, it it can also be like uh, you you can mega dose it for for, sure. for patients with uh, with uh, abdominal obesity. Yeah. I'm I'm sure it can it can help in many ways, even if it doesn't re- if it wouldn't reduce visceral fat. Yeah, you know we've talked a lot about therapeutics and supplements and those kind of things, but I guess your clinic still like I guess guides people with like the basics as well, like uh, diet and exercise. So do you have anything to like add about diet and exercise? Are there anything like specific that you share with your uh, clients at the clinic? Sure. Yeah. Well, my advice has been changing over the years. Um, maybe I can speak about what I don't do so recommend anymore, and that would be easier. For instance, I don't recommend intermittent fasting for more than 12 hours. Mm-hmm. To me, that's suboptimal for muscle homeostasis. And again, I mostly treat older people, uh, 45 years or older, so it's something that becomes more and more important uh, as we age to preserve as much muscle as possible and to rebuild as much as possible. So I won't recommend longer fasting periods unless that person needs to improve blood glucose metabolism or reduce uh Reduce uh, lipids, blood lipids. Mostly that that would be it. Uh, for losing weight, it's suboptimal as well. So mm. it's much better to eat five times a day. In s- small meals, high amounts of protein on each meal, low carbs, high healthy fats, and that will that will do that will do the trick. Much better than than try to restrict them, especially if they're not used to, because then they will snack. It makes it 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 makes the it purposeless it makes it meaning um right. useless uh, i don't do prolonged episodic fasting anymore personally but i recommend it to some people if i don't prescribe rapamycin i make them fast from between 24 to 72 hours a few times a year for example a patient I had 
he was a very busy businessman. Um, had only a couple occasions uh, when he had short holidays during the year. I met him, uh, he had to lose weight. He str really struggled with that. I made him fast for 72 hours uh, during his summer holidays, for 72 hours immediately after the Christmas holidays, which in Spain are a big thing and people like to eat a lot and drink a lot. So immediately after, I gave him this protocol. He did first one week of fasting mimicking diet, followed by 72 hours of fast. He had never done it before and he did it beautifully. And he didn't struggle at all. Then he could start to see improvements, probably just due to, in a small percentage, it was it was a lot of a lot of fat, but it was mostly due to liquid retention and glycogen retention. But he could see a change in the scale, and that created a lot of motivation for him to carry on. And then he started adhering to his diet much better, cooking be cooking healthier, eating better and seeing improvements. Um, yeah, and regarding exercise, I recommend people to focus on resistance training unless they have a really poor health condition. So if they have never, never, ever trained for the past decade or so, I will suggest them to start with some moderate cardio and then one day a week of weight training. And then once they've achieved a good level of active lifestyle, I will reduce the cardio to a minimum of uh, 120 minutes a week of moderate intensity cardio and three to four days of uh, weight training, which is what I do actually myself. Mm -hmm. I do four days resistance training where I focus on resistance, so I burn a lot of calories. I don't do much strength. So the approach would be, I have to resist the weight. I don't have to push it. I don't have to become strong man, but I need my muscles to work as a metabolically active organ. How do I do that? Present resistance to the weight. So slow, really well-executed exercises, moderate weight, not super crazy high, uh, long series of, uh, of reps. Mm. Then four days a week I do that, one day a week I do cardio. Gotcha. And the rest of the time I try to walk everywhere I go. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good workout routine. Um, coming back to the the three-step plan so let's say a person goes through that do they repeat it or what how does it look like after after the third stage so it will depend on the plan but uh on the premium most uh, comprehensive plan there's a, a follow-up visit that's included after six months where we measure everything again we measure NAD levels, we measure epigenetic clocks, immune function, and see what's improved and what hasn't. And then if the patient wishes to purchase another plan, we can keep working on that and it will include more therapies. If they wish to keep working on that on their own, which is already an option, uh, I, give some, I give them some guidelines focused on improving the worst aspects of their health and then they can keep coming to the clinic for extra follow-up visits uh, where i revise their supplement protocol i may order one blood test once a year and uh, maybe make a few adjustments but the best option would be to repeat it obviously it can be done once every three years and once once the situation has changed, once your age has changed, it makes a lot of sense to revisit every marker and adjust things, adjust supplements, adjust your routine, and again, uh, maybe have a different type of peptide therapy, maybe have a 
mm, a different type of regenerative therapy. The the options are huge, so mm. it's it's yeah. something. Uh, it would fall into the category of precision personalized medicine. There's no plan for everybody. Yeah, for sure. And again, you know that the same kind of. I like the the idea behind having this three step plan uh, because you can apply it to like you know outside of the clinic as well for everyday people who are just looking to improve their health. So first you measure and you know get a baseline of okay, what's my health and what's my status right now, and then you, I guess yeah the kind of elimination phase or trying to uh, help to clean the body in in the mm -hmm. lack of a better word. And then the the next step would be like try to actually rebuild it and uh, support it, so you can apply this kind of a m mindset to the pro or this kind of protocol, this routine. It's like the it's like the phoenix bird, right? It's to burn into ashes before re being reborn younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet, like you said, you don't want to you know start to regenerate the junk material, kind of. So yeah, it makes sense to kind of follow this routine. You don't want to regenerate. Or to to promote the, the growth of cells that produce CD thirty eight, for instance. Mm. Yeah, you don't want to fuel them with NAD. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. That's so. That's my approach, and also the trying to get the best of both worlds from anabolic and catabolic phases. So promoting growth is good so long as it does not happen 100% of the time. And restricting calories and promoting autophagy and recycling recycling the bad stuff that accumulates in the body into good stuff cannot be a lifestyle because it will end up harming you, causing harm. So in my opinion, it should be 80% growth, 20% autophagy and re rebuilding the body and that can be applied on a yearly basis for for instance you can do eight to ten months of bulk followed by two to four months of caloric deficit or you could do it weekly for uh, for example what i do is train for four days strength and during these four days, I eat a lot of protein. I eat a lot of calories. I don't really count them. I may, I may have to start cutting carbs uh, in light of my last blood test, which I will certainly start doing now. Um, but um, the thing is, you want to promote muscle homeostasis. You need a high input of protein. And you need to keep your antioxidant levels low at least the exogenous ones you can take melatonin because it will it will enter a funnel and only the amount of antioxidants that you need will be released it won't mega dose you antioxidants but you shouldn't be taking other antioxidants such as uh, broccoli extract uh, vitamin c astaxanthin whatever and the other 20% of the time you want high antioxidants you want rapamycin or spermidin or fasting or caloric deficit in any form and then you won't be under too much stress you won't be losing muscle by just doing it for two to three days and you'll soon switch back into the growth phase so you get the idea that's like to me that's the getting the best of both worlds yeah cycling between them um but yeah i mean it's been great talking with you for, and uh yeah we could talk many hours on these different uh, therapies but i think it's been Anytime. a very yeah it's been a very good uh, overview about this uh, and the, the three st step i think process. we've touched upon so many topics that we should uh <laughs> like uh <laughs> like decide on one single topic for our next meeting yeah for sure That's and a good expand idea. on that yeah it's a good introduction but uh, yeah where can people find you and your work oh, sorry once again where can people uh, find you and uh, your work 
Yes. Uh, well, I can be found on on Instagram. It's my profile is Alexis low hyphen Ortega low hyphen MD medical doctor, and I can be found in Barcelona, Spain, most of the year. I work there. I am the medical director of the clinic, uh, so you can find me there. You, you've got my my website okay. is uh, uh, Adastra Clinic AD from Denmark astraclinic.com and you can find all the information there all my contact details everything as well as in my instagram profile sounds good uh it's been a great to talk with you my last question is uh what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner i wish i had sooner start measuring things <laughs> yeah so Probably I started when I was 30 something, 31. I should have started before because I could have addressed some things earlier. I could have learned a lot about myself. And I'm not talking about sophisticated stuff, just blood tests, just a routine blood test. Anyone between 20 to 30 years old should do it at least once a year. You'll get to know yourself better. You'll get to know if your lifestyle is doing you good or bad, and, and you will start to become interested in your health, and, and hopefully that interest will last for the rest of your life. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> one massive takeaway I think everyone should uh, take. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast and uh, sharing your uh, knowledge. My pleasure. All right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.